we have Robin Gale, who um, has been with us before. She, I think maybe a month ago or a little longer, did a Feeding Your Demons session with us, which was really awesome. Um, and, and she is back today, um, and she will be teaching on the four immeasurables. And just a little reminder that um, Robin is a Tara Mandala authorized teacher. She's also a psychotherapist in private practice in Marin County. And she serves as professor and chair of the counseling psychology at Dominican University um, and is a research scientist for the Center for Contemplative Research in Crestone, Colorado, which is where she's at currently right now. And she has been studying Buddhism since maybe 1986 or so, I think I saw in her bio. So we are very lucky to have her. Thank you so much for being here, Robin. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me back. And it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I have visited your center at least once. And um, it's a beautiful place to gather and, you know, really a, a fun area to be in. So I hope someday I'll be back in California. And be able to come see you in person because, you know, I know remote is a little remote and we're all tired of it, <laughs> but <laughs> here we are. <laughs> and um, let's just begin by establishing our aspiration for this hour, hour and a half as the case may be, and um, set our aspiration that this time be a benefit to both ourselves, oneself, and for the benefit of all beings, and particularly those that arise upon our path that we can help through our practice of bodhicitta. And aspiration is a very important part of every practice, as you already know, and it's particularly important for the practice of bodhicitta which then has as its skillful means, the four immeasurables or the four boundless attitudes or the Brahma Vihara, whatever school you're studying with, it's the same, um, the same four immeasurables. And um, so bodhicitta, you know, aspiration is the, the heart. It's, it's the heart of bodhicitta. It's this, we try to stimulate the heart of bodhicitta, stimulate the heart of compassion. And it starts with aspiration. So um, that's a quick and easy way to get going <laughs> in our practice. Um, the second thing that's inherent in, you know, the practice of bodhicitta and the four measurables and, and also the practice that Eve told me that you were doing a pretty deep dive on, which is the four applications of mindfulness. Um, it takes a very steady and balanced mind to, to do the investigative inquiry into such things as the four applications of mindfulness, but it also takes a really steady mind to um, apply your bodhicitta or do um, authentic for immeasurable practice, practices. So, um, you know, if your mind isn't, isn't balanced, if your emotions aren't steady, then what are you bringing to others in your bodhicitta practice and four measurables? Are you just, you know, clicking off your mala beads, you know, because it's part of your nundra or it's something you have to do, which is going to burn, you're going to get burnt out pretty quickly doing that. Or is it really um, something that comes from a balanced, joyous, eudaimonic perspective, as um, even Alan Wallace would say? And so that's 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 what we're going to talk about tonight. We will talk about bodhicitta and the four immeasurables, but what we're really going to talk about is the nature and the energy of giving that giving and taking that exchange of bodhicitta with its skillful means of the four immeasurables. Because, you know, too often, you know, we're not full and nurtured ourselves. It's been a long day. We've worked, you know, we've given it at the office. And, and so 
you know, Buddhism has a lot of to do's. You're, you're getting that looking at those four applications of mindfulness. Bodhicitta is no exception. Four immeasurables is one more thing to do. So how do we do it in a way that's refreshing for both yourself and the people that you're trying to nurture? Um, so that's a long sort of intro to our topic today, but I want to circle back to let's create a little bit of a balanced mind and emotions here and do, you know, just five minutes of shamatha practice. It's the king of all practices for stabilizing the mind. It's great to do after a long day of activity. It's just a moment where you get to stop and rest and ponder and take a time out. Um, the only requisite for shamatha is that you watch, that you don't go too far into excitation or too far into dullness. You just want to stay in the middle. Are thoughts going to rise? Of course they are. Thoughts are always going to rise. They don't stop. They never stop. So it's not about stopping thoughts. It's about finding the space in between or maybe pulling back and becoming the observer of those thoughts. And so that's that's a bit of what shamatha can do. It's It should be very nurturing, not necessarily a discipline. And sometimes shamatha is taught very discipline oriented. It's taught as a concentration practice. And it certainly has that side to it. You can find, you know, a whole tiered nine step process of achieving shamatha. And it has very strict ways to do that. And it's exciting because you could actually reach the crossing over and find liberation. However, that's a long path. And so in 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 our tradition at Tara Mandala, of which I'm you know an authorized teacher, so I kind of have to stick with our tradition, even though I'm here studying and working at this, you know, shamatha um, hermitage, <laughs> which does it completely different. It's the seven, you know, it's the nine step process here. But, you know, it's very relieving and refreshing and energetic to go back to my Tara Mandala roots and practice shamatha the way that we're taught there. And at Tara Mandala, the, pra the, the focus on shamatha is on calm abiding, emphasize abiding. <laughs> And what are you abiding with? You're ab ab abiding with your calm, first of all. And then you're abiding with the breath. You're resting with the breath. The emphasis isn't on concentration. It's on release and resting. So let me just guide you through shamatha practice um, as we have come to rest in it at Tara Mandala. And then we'll move into ways to make our bodhicitta and for a measurable practice um, robust and refreshing to ourselves and to others. So it's not all give and no receive. Um, so just for now, I'm sure you probably um, start all of these Wellness Wednesdays with some calm abiding, I hope so. So find a co comfortable position and we're all, we only have time to spend about five minutes on it, but that'll do it. A little dab will do it. So find a comfortable position. And the main thing is wherever you're sitting, that your back be straight. So you're not slumping or, you know, slouching or laying sideways. And then in all shamatha practices, we take stock of the seven point posture, post seven point posture of Iroshina. He's the one way back and, you know, many millennia ago developed this, but it's still good today. And so starting from the top down, your eyes are slightly open and looking slightly downward, but not focusing on anything. It's almost as if your eyes are trying to take in a, a 180 view of the world, you know, a real panorama. And that's a practice in itself because our eyes are constantly training to focus, right? We've got to focus. And so to try to reverse that and not focus, that's a whole practice. But it begins that release and relaxation as I do it right now, even though I do have to look at a camera, 
I can still like relax my gaze and take in the perimeter, the 180 perimeter. I don't have to really look at that camera. I can look, you know, at, 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 at my hands. I have my hands outstretched side by side. I can look at the whole panorama between those two hands and just relax my eyes. And boy, does that feel good if you have a computer oriented uh, job. And then coming down the mouth, you just want your mouth, your jaw to be relaxed, your mouth slightly open, your tongue behind the, your top teeth, kind of resting on your palate if that's comfortable. Yeah, and if you can breathe through the mouth, it's said that that is really helpful energetically for future practices, but some people find that really uncomfortable. It, it took me a very long time to feel at all comfortable breathing through my mouth. So it really doesn't matter that much. Mainly just relax your jaw, breathe in and out slowly. Third is your neck and just make sure your neck, they say, make it like a shepherd's crook so that it goes up and over your cranium and kind of down to your, about the level of your nose is the edge of that crook but you want your neck to be sort of relaxed. You can kind of move forward and then move back just to that place where it opens and relaxes and let it be right there. And all of this is to open your channels and your winds and make your breath easier and create a, a better flow of energy, which in itself right from the start is refreshing. You're gonna get tired of me talking about refreshing tonight. <laughs> My hope is it will be refreshed by the end of tonight. And then moving down to your shoulders, your shoulders should be back and down, a little bit like vulture wings. They stick out a tiny bit, but they should be back and down, opening your chest so that your breathing is easy and free. And moving down to your arms, your hands can either be in meditative equipoise just below your navel one on top of the other, symbolizing emptiness and skillful means. Or they can take the Dzogchen posture and rest on your knees, loosely on your knees. That's okay too. And your spine is straight. The metaphor is often a stack of gold coins. And then the legs. Well, of course, the royal prof posture is lotus posture, but I don't know about you, but my uh, hips and knees won't, won't easily go into lotus posture anymore. <laughs> and it's not important. What's important is that you're in a posture that supports the straight evenness of your back and, and your breath so that your winds can be unencumbered and you and a posture where you won't fall over and one where you won't slouch. And so that's how we begin. And right off the bat, that's a little bit refreshing, right? It's a little bit somatically making contact with ourselves. And now let's go even a little deeper and let's abide what are we abiding with? We're abiding with the breath. In shamatha practice, there's all kinds of focus of attention. It could be a candle flame, a tanka, sky, clouds, awareness. It, it's all fine. They all have their purpose. But why not the breath? The breath is kind of seen, again, like the, the royal point of contact. It's always with you. It's with you in the grocery line. It's with you at the stoplight. Anytime you want, you can, you can just rest your attention on your breath. Let it abide there. Really feel that in and out, unencumbered breath. And if you think about it, you know, deep breathing and rhythmic breathing, breathing, it's a little bit like an internal massage because 
your clothes move against your skin, your skin moves against your muscles, your muscles move against your bones, your bones move against your organs. And if you're really in tune, you can feel your organs move against each other. That's all happening as you breathe. So it's like a freebie. It's like a free internal massage. What's better than that? So just take a moment to breathe and abide with the breath. You're not doing anything with it. There's no effort, no counting, no this breath is long and this breath is short and there's my pause and there's the gap and no, none of that. Too much concentrating if you're doing that. Just abide and just relax and feel. And then, of course, you're going to notice some thoughts. Thoughts never end. Don't try to repress them or do anything with them. Sometimes the metaphor is like a, a, a carousel, a pony carousel, one of those kids' rides or adult rides, if you're me. And those ponies, they just go around and around and you can notice them and you can let them go and you can notice them and you can let them go. And if one thought or another grabs you and gallops away with you, that's okay. Even if it's two or three minutes later before you notice, which is quite common, that's okay. Just come back, come back to the breath. Let that thought go. Don't elaborate, don't create a big narrative. For heaven's sakes, don't create a strategy out of the narrative. <laughs> All of that will seem silly tomorrow anyway. Just let the thoughts go. If they're so important, you can pick them up later. I promise you. Just rest. Okay, thank you. We can come back now. I don't like to do really long meditations in the evening on a Wednesday in the middle of our work week <laughs> because the sharpness we start out with, with will quickly become dullness and fatigue if we're tired, which we might be at 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. Um, so just come on back. Thank you for your practice. Hopefully we're a little bit more present and grounded. Yeah, so Eve did tell me that you're studying um, old path white clouds and specifically, yeah, those four foundations of mindfulness. And, um, you know, that's very much a Mahayana practice. And in the Mahayana tradition, there are these four foundations of mindfulness that you're studying. There's also a, a really big emphasis on bodhicitta and its um, four measurables. So let's just start with bodhicitta and make sure we're all on the same page. But again, I'll give you a few definitions. We will talk about a few concepts, but my goal is to stay right with the nature and energy of the thing. Like, what does it feel like to give and take bodhicitta? And what do you do when you don't feel like it? <laughs> I think that's important in today's world. Because just doing it out of 
habit or out of obligation is not really the point. It's some point, it's gathering merit, no, sure, no, no, no doubt about it, but it's not really doing what it's designed to do. So bodhicitta is the power and energy that fuels the bodhisattva vow. And I, I would be surprised if any of you have not heard the bodhisattva vow. And Shantideva says it best. Here we go. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, so long may I remain for the alleviation of suffering of the world. It is to strive to bring a complete end to all the sufferings of others. And of course we feel that way. And of course we have compassion. And of course we wanna practice this. But what happens when you just don't have it to give? <laughs> That's what we're gonna look at tonight. Um, and so uh, humor me here. I do this with all my groups and I, you know, I'm a psychologist and a professor. So I do this with all of my classes, but let's just do a little self experiment here. And so we're going to do this at the beginning of the hour. And then if I can remember, I'll ask you to check in at the end of the hour. But if you were to place the strength of your bodhicitta energy tonight, just tonight, not last week or next year, just tonight, if you were to place the strength of your bodhicitta energy on a scale of one to 10 tonight, where 10 is like really robust, man, I've got so much to give. I'm just going to save the world. And then one is, you know, a little bit anemic, you know, not really feeling it. You know, my energy is lower than a snake's belly. <laughs> um, where would you place your number tonight? Um, you know, would it be a three, four, five, six, seven, eight? Uh, where would you put it? And, um, you know, just keep track of that number. We'll see at the end of the evening if your number has moved. If it's moved up in just this hour, then we know that listening, reflecting, and meditating on the teachings about Bodhicitta made a difference. That's what all of the great ones say. So let's see if it's true. And um, if your number goes down, and it might, no judgment, probably means you've been working too hard and looking at screens for too long. And as much as you want to be here tonight, it just really took a lot out of you. And, you know, that's okay. That's good. That's a good self-check too. And, you know, no harm. Maybe you'll want to adopt one of the contemplative methods suggested today to replenish yourself and replenish your ability to give. So we'll just kind of watch and see. So um, bodhicitta, uh, chitta means mind and bodhi is awakening and it's awakening with, uh, so it's the mind that is aimed at awakening. So it's all about awakening. Let's keep track of that. With wisdom and compassion, Wisdom is wisdom, wisdom of what? Wisdom of emptiness, but we'll, you know, we, we've got to unpack that. And compassion, fair enough, for the benefit of all sentient beings. And it's often translated as awakening mind, awakening mind. So I think it's really important to, to be clear here at the outset that we're not just talking about ordinary mind. We're not aiming for a better ordinary mind. What is ordinary mind made up of? It's made up of the coarse mental factors and the subtle mental factors. We know the coarse ones, they come barreling out of us. It's not just mental either. It's, you know, when we say mind in Buddhism, it's always mental, emotional altogether. I'm not even sure that Tibetans separate mental and emotional. They have different words for it. So we're looking at the mental and emotional coarse mind, 
these are the emotions that come barreling out of us, like, you know, the three poisons for one, you know, anger, ignorance, delusion, and craving. And, you know, these, this coarse mind, part, it, it, you can't really blame yourself for developing it, although we do kind of reinforce it through our habitual tendencies. But we come into the world with the karmic seeds for the three poisons. This is basic Buddhism, you know, craving, attachment, delusion, and dullness, and ignorance, rather, and, and um, anger and hostility. You know, watch a baby. Nobody has to teach a baby or a child how to have anger or how to have, you know, how to, how to be selfish, have the ignorance of selfishness or how to crave the chocolate cake. Nobody, nobody teaches a child how to do that. We come in with these basic habitual tendencies. Now we can reinforce them and we can reinforce them, reinforce them um, in negative ways, but we can also reinforce them in positive ways. But in any case, that's not awakening mind. <laughs> That's not awakened mind. It's not awakening mind. It's the course mental and emotional factors. If we meditate enough, or we're just intuitive enough, or we're self introspective enough, we can definitely, you know, sink right down through the course mind and feel the subtle mental and emotional factors. They're subtle because they're, they're these are the kinds of things like our implicit biases or our imputations, you know, thinking something is one thing when it's really another. These are, are um, they're just subtle, they're subtle. They are perceptions, sensations. They're like the five aggregates that just get us going. You know, we, we, we experience something, we have an emotional reaction, we give it a name, we give it a form, we give it a strategy, we wanna do something with it, we grasp, we, you know, but it all starts very subtly. Sometimes we don't even know. I mean, isn't this the stuff that we are learning in the last few years about um, implicit bias, that our implicit bias and our, our you know, um, prejudices and racism is all based in this very subtle mind of perceptions, kind of almost like made up of really un imperceptible fear or something like, oh, I'm afraid of that person. You don't even realize that you don't even recognize that sometimes you just find yourself crossing the street. You know, so it's very subtle, but through meditation and through, through introspection, we can, we can, we can, we can see, we can feel, we can ascertain the subtle mind, but keep on going, keep going. You want to go through the course, through the subtle, keep meditating because then you will come down to, again, sorry for all the Buddhist terms, but laya vision on it. It's your substrate consciousness. It's where all your karmic seeds are stored. It's very subtle, but you know, it's good to get there because then you get the bigger picture. <laughs> you might even see all your past lifetimes. But you still want to keep on going because the mind of awakening is the ground, the luminous ground of our being. It's even below our karmic seeds. And it's, you know, it's um, it has no beginning. It has no end. Comes from no, nowhere, goes nowhere, dwells nowhere. It's the ground, you know, luminosity and clarity of our whole being. That's the awakened mind. It can break through. Sometimes it breaks through because there's been a trauma, unfortunately, you know, and the clouds part and suddenly you see the light like, oh, nothing mattered anyway. You know, you know, my child almost died in, in the scheme of that. Nothing else really matters. You really get it. You wake up, you get a glimpse. Um, you know, other times, sometimes the glimpse comes because we're so dang exhausted. We just can't perseverate anymore about our problems. We flop down on the bed and there, there's a glimpse of like, it's just, it's that moment of letting go and suddenly something breaks through and it's like, oh, yes, of course, you know, that's it. I don't really need to hold this. I can just let it go. You know, that's a glimpse. Um, the Mahayana Buddhists, you know, call, they have a name for this ground luminosity and it's called Buddha nature. And it's, it's actually, they located in our heart chakra, not, not necessarily our physical heart, but it's like a little portal in our heart chakra. 
And it's this uncompounded luminous clarity that we're all born with. We all have it. You don't have to, you don't have to create it or develop it or go searching for it or, you know, you know, cut the chakra open and peel it apart and try to find it. <laughs> it's there. It's like the sun. It's just there where it's there. And it's just our the clouds of our mental and emotional obscurations that cover it up. And so, um, so this brightly shining Buddha nature, that is the spirit of awakening. That is what bodhicitta is, is the Buddha nature. And the way that bodhicitta expresses is through, through compassion, this aspiration of caring and compassion for oneself and others. And then also through wisdom um action well i'm sorry through aspiration and then through action actually acting on what rises up to meet you on your path thereby converting suffering on into felicity on your path wouldn't that be great <laughs> um so let's see how we can get there because it's a beautiful thing I know you're all meditators. I know you must be very intuitive and introspective or you wouldn't want to come to a talk like this or any talks like this on your Wednesday wellness series. And so, so you've already got half the job done. And I'm pretty sure that you have a, a pretty decent dose of compassion and caring for others. Because again, you just wouldn't be a be on a, any kind of spiritual path if you didn't. You know, we can't extract ourselves from our interconnectedness with all beings and just go for our own salvation. I mean, that just that runs out of gas very quickly. <laughs> so, so I know we're we're you know I know you know what I'm talking about when I talk about this uncompounded, uncreated Buddha nature. You've had glimpses of it, I'm certain. It's it's like a little infusion of um, light and it's wonderful to get there. So how do we get there? And how do we get there when we are too tired to get there? That's, that's, that's the theme of my talk tonight. Isn't that great? Um, so um, let's see. So there's uh, there's two aspects to bodhicitta. We're gonna do this systematically here there's compassion which is very active and aspirational and then there's the wisdom of emptiness which is that um there aren't really chunky substantial things to do to climb the ladder to this awakening that we all desire there is no ladder. There is nowhere else to go. It's not somewhere else. It's right here. It's right now. And so, and that's what emptiness is. There's no getting somewhere. It's not the old Martin Luther works righteousness. So this compassion blends. Yes, it's compassionate. Yes, it is active. Yes, it is a felt sense. Yes, we can cultivate it. Yes, we want to cultivate it. Yes, we want the breakthrough of Buddha nature. But it's it only it only works if we infuse it with the wisdom of emptiness. Because there really isn't anything to do except to wake up in every single moment. And that will bring on the Buddha nature. It's not working towards something. It's not, it's not necessarily a developmental path, even though there are things to do because we live in the conventional world and we've got arms and legs, but it's not necessarily developmental. Like I'm trying to get to some high level of bodhicitta. It's simultaneous with the opportunity for it to arise anytime you can wake up right now. And so, the way that that compassion and that wisdom of emptiness combines 
actually um, determines whether it kind of determines relative bodhicitta versus ultimate bodhicitta. So relative bodhicitta has has aspiration and action. I'd be surprised if you guys hadn't run into this before. <laughs> Pretty standard. Aspiration is the pledge or the wish to accomplish perfect enlightenment. Um, and it encompasses the four immeasurables and recognizes the equality of self and others. And it practices the exchange of self and others. Cherishing of, one, of others more than oneself. And then the action bodhicitta is the pledge to practice the six paramitas and to actually practice them. So it's generosity, discipline, patience, diligence, concentration, and wisdom. That's what your six little water bowls on your shrine um, represent. Um, and then ultimate bodhicitta is is that empty nature of all that you're doing and that we're interdependent. And um, so there's many schools of Buddhism that describe this topic in many ways. And I'm not going to present all of the different ways, but again, a focus on the practice dynamics of bodhicitta that's common to all the stages and paths. Um, Okay, let me just see. And, you know, again, just one more plug that, you know, whether you're doing action bodhicitta or aspiration bodhicitta or ultimate bodhicitta or foreign measurables or exchanging self from others, it there one isn't better than others. We have to apply whatever skillful means we can according to our capacity in any given moment and according to the needs of the beings in front of us. So we should really be fluent in a whole menu of different ways to um, stimulate our heart of compassion and then also give to other beings. And so let's, let's do a little self um, experiment. Well, a little guided visualization here. Just beginning with this aspirational bodhicitta. It's said that one begins by stimulating and indeed fabricating a feeling by virtue of using reference that are easy to feel for first. That's kind of a mouthful, came from Treasury of Precious Qualities. Um, but it's a natural first step and it stimulates compassion. What does it mean? It means start with somebody that you already really, really love and have a lot of compassion for. I'm pretty sure all of us have one person like that. And so just bring to mind someone that you care deeply for. And, you know, just somebody who it's just automatic that when you think about them, your heart opens, you wish the best for them. You want them to, you know, be happy, be free of pain, free of suffering. You, know, you just smile when you think about them. You don't want any harm to come to them. You just have absolutely nothing but joy and love and caring for them. And really take a moment to feel how that feels in your heart. When you bring them to mind, that very feeling And so it's said in this process that that's the first step. You've got to find a target in your own very heart, to your own very being that knows what it feels like to be open and loving and caring. And then that's your template. That's your goal. Your goal is to start there. And from there, we do move out in the four four boundless attitudes or four measurables, we do move out, you know, in, and try to extend that feeling to ourselves. Can you feel just as much compassion and love and caring and goodwill for yourself as you feel for that loved one? 
And again, you really want to feel it in your heart. It, this is a somatic experience. It's not a thought. I know we think we think we think our feelings, but we don't. We feel them. We feel them in our bodies. So you want to keep that target in your heart center, that openness towards yourself. And then we kind of move out to the next one we move out to is generally a neutral person. So neutral that it's like the, you know, post post office attendant where you're dropping your packages off. Of course, if you live in a small town like I do, you might know that person quite well, but generally we don't. And so you want to extend, see if you can extend your heart of compassion towards them, knowing that they too, just like your loved one and just like yourself, wishes to be free from suffering and wishes to be filled with happiness. And just wish them well. May you be free from suffering. May you find happiness in the causes and conditions of happiness. And then, and only if you've still got that really good feeling in your heart, that stimulation, that stimulated heart of compassion, then you might bring, bring to mind a difficult person. And, and just know, don't get into the story, don't get into the hurt, don't lose that feeling in your heart. Just know that this difficult person, like yourself and like your, like your loved one, also wishes to be free from suffering and filled with more opportunities for happiness. I can't think of anybody on earth who doesn't want that. And misguided though their behavior might be, and we can think of some great examples, still, I guarantee you that behavior was coming from a seed of wanting to um, find happiness and alleviate suffering. So just wish for them as well, that they find happiness and reduce their suffering. And then if you still have that open, feeling in your heart, you can extend loving kindness out to the whole world. But you know, the world is really deep and vast right now, and we hold a lot of the news in the palm of our hands. So that could be a little, little beyond reach in a genuine way. So in whatever way you can, say a prayer. So that's that's the loving kindness sequence of the four boundless attitudes, the four measurables. And um, I wanted to give you a taste of it because, you know, in, in the East, well, let's not say East and West because where is that these days, but traditionally, traditional Tibetan Buddhism, traditional Buddhism, they would start that sequence. Well, in fact, they they might not even put um, they might not put oneself even in that picture. They would just do a loved one, a neutral person, and a difficult person. But here in the modern era, all of my Western teachers have received um, the endorsement by the Dalai Lama to be able to put oneself in the picture. <laughs> Because if one doesn't feel any modicum of self-love and compassion, how are we going to extend that to others? And you can probably um, guess as well as I can why the why the our modern situation um, might not might not might not develop might not develop individuals who have a lot of self-love and a lot of self-compassion. And that's a topic for another night. 
There's another contemplative method for stimulating this aspiration bodhicitta. It's called the seven point causal sequence. And again, there's a little bit of a problem right out of the gate for modern, you know, meditators. And you probably know what it is. It's seeing all beings as one's mother. <laughs> and again, that's another topic, but generally in the in in you know these days, we don't have the same fond, compassionate feeling about our mothers that you know Tibetan cultures did, you know, very rural loving um pastoral families so it's problematic uh to say think of all beings as one's mother so what i like to say is reflect on someone in your life who has recently shown kind kindness to you so let's all do that 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 that's a really beautiful um exercise Think of somebody in your life that has recently shown kindness to you and bring that person to mind and bring to mind the way it felt to have that kindness offered to you. And as you think of that, Maybe you can locate a feeling of gratitude for the kindness that that person has shown and the way it made you feel. And from that gratitude, just generate feelings of warmth. Warmth. And tenderness, tender compassion not towards anybody, not this time. You're not, don't, you don't have to give it away. It's okay just to have someone show kindness to you and to keep it for yourself, so to speak. And then from there, just Cultivate the aspiration that you too might gain enough enlightenment for the sake of others. You too might be a person who could be could offer this kindness to others, intentionally or unintentionally. A lot of a lot of times we receive kindness that people you know just because someone's kind, they're not trying to do anything. But this part is kind of like reversing how much guilt and shame we carry around, you know. We tend to be so good at beating ourselves up for what we're not doing, what we're not giving, how we did that wrong, and how we, we hurt this person, and we better not hurt that person, and all, you know. In this case, you're trying to reverse it and just make the pledge that you you will gain enlightenment for the sake of others. You will be a person who shares as much kindness as you give, as you, as you receive. And so that's a really beautiful aspiration. And it doesn't have, have to have anything else to it. It's just allowing yourself to feel the gratitude of having kindness showered upon you and making the aspiration that you someday or immediately will share kindness with others. And then we already talked a little about loving kindness, which is just one of the four immeasurable attitudes. There's also compassion, which is what we just talked about, this kind of resolute determination to free beings from their pain. And empathetic joy, which is a sincere pleasure at the happiness and prosperity of others. Which if you think about it, you know, why not? It's free, it's available. You see somebody else being happy, you just get to share in it. Get to have empathetic joy. 
equanimity, which is, of course, a lack of bias, ability to see all beings as e equal. And so these four boundless attitudes, first, it's just thinking about them in the ways that we just have been thinking about them. You know, loving kindness by bringing somebody you love to mind, extending that feeling towards yourself, towards neutral people, towards difficult people. And then the compassion, which is what we were just talking about, this determination to be to be enlightened just so you can help others be free from pain. And empathetic joy and equanimity. They're all meditations in and of themselves and they have a set formula. They do all tend to go through first, you know, towards, um, you know, a person that you um, love and then a neutral person and then a difficult person. That tends to be the series for each one of them. And those, um, that that meditation, those meditations are easily accessible on the web or in any number of books. Um, but basically all you have to remember, <laughs> all you have to remember is, may you be free from the causes and conditions of suffering and may you find happiness and the causes and conditions of happiness. If you just did that to every person and situation that you encountered, then you would be on the Bodhisattva path. Um, and there is, um, there is, there, there are two more ways to cultivate this aspirational bodhicitta, and I'm not going to dwell on them because I don't, I don't, I think they, they, they can create this, um, refreshing effulgence that I'm trying to, you know, zero in on tonight, or, or they could also feel like, you know, more discipline, one more thing to do. One is called, um, the four white and the four dark factors, and I'm not going to go into them, but basically, you know, the idea is that you want to cultivate positive behavior, the kind that um, liberates your cognitive and emotional obscurations, because of course, you know, you're not going to be able to be very effective in the world if every time you get off your cushion and go out the door, you're, you know, all of your bad habits just you know, take over. <laughs> so you want to kind of practice accumulating merit through um, reducing your emotional reactivity and increasing your your enlightened responses. Um, and so that's 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 uh, you know it's just a practice of reducing our obscurations and and enhancing our transformed enlightened wisdom qualities. And then finally, there's the practice of Tonglen. And I'd be surprised if you hadn't heard of that, this either. And it's the practice of giving and taking. And it's a really beautiful practice. But again, if you're not fully centered in your own effulgence of Buddha nature that's coming, you're radiating from the ground of your being, and you're not feeling that openness and that love and compassion from your heart center, then Tong Lin is um, potentially difficult. And I'll let me give you the, 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 the description for Tong Lin. It can be a very beautiful practice and it can be a very heart opening practice, or it could be a little bit uh, like, what? <laughs> I don't have that to give. So here it is using the rhythm of the breath. Upon exhaling, one imagines all of their own happiness and knowledge and good qualities being given away to others. Then one imagines others are set completely free from their pain and suffering as this pain, this pain, meaning their pain, is taken into oneself on the stream of the inhalation. And one prays without ceasing that all beings are free from pain and never lose their happiness until they attain enlightenment. Well, it's a very beautiful practice if you got it in you, but if you don't, I mean, what if, you know, what if you come home from work, you feel like you gave it the office and what you're going to give all of your own happiness and knowledge and good qualities to some, to someone else, and you're going to breathe in their pain. 
Honestly, the only time I can do that in a nanosecond is with my daughter. I don't know. I don't think I can do it with anybody else. <laughs> but there are times, especially on retreats, when you're feeling full and you're feeling in touch with your Buddha nature and you're feeling full of bodhicitta, where Tonglen is just a very, very powerful practice that opens your heart even more because it goes into that emptiness aspect that my pain and your pain are not really separate. There's no real line between the two. I can't genuinely be happy if you're in pain, really. You know, it's got to have it's got to have that equanimity. And this practice is really beautiful for that. And if you if you want to experience this practice, uh, Lama Sultram has a really great 20 minute Tonglen guided meditation. And it's on YouTube and you can find it. Just put it in the search bar, Lama Sultram Tonglen, and you'll find it. And she'll guide you through it in a way that I guarantee will be lovely and not draining. <laughs> um, but this is not the practice I chose for tonight. I chose one that is a little bit more refreshing. And we're going to spend the last um, 20 minutes tonight doing a, re um, a little bit more of a uh, refreshing practice but just not to leave anything off here so those were all aspirations those all everything we've talked about up to this point stimulates the heart of compassion and we mean that in, in the most concrete terms stimulate you should feel it you should feel little butterflies in your heart like you know oh yeah I feel compelled to give because I've got enough and I and you are not separate and you know, um, it's it's a feeling. From that feeling, we we do generally um, then want to see everything that arises on our path as an opportunity. They call it an adventitious arising, even if it's a difficult thing that's arising on our path. It's adventitious for our awakening because we can apply some skillful means in that moment to. Um, liberate that um, issue. So that's where these six paramitas come in. The generosity, discipline, patience, diligence, concentration, and then wisdom. And um, it's said that the first five, generosity, discipline, patience, diligence, concentration, those those are all things that you do for certain and they take energy for certain and they could be draining and they could just be another have to. But if they're infused with this wisdom of emptiness, then every time you have an opportunity to be generous, to apply discipline, to be patient, to apply diligence, to concentrate and meditate more deeply, if you are doing that in the spirit of, of the wisdom of emptiness, then you're really doing it not just for the situation at hand, but it's part of your own awakening. It's part of your practice. They say the person, the giver, the one given to, and the giving practice, they're all empty. They're all just there for you. <laughs> it sounds very self-centered, doesn't it? <laughs> it's all there for you to, there, um, to, to, to deepen your practice. And, and um, yeah. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, so if you approach the path, the active path of meditation with the wisdom of emptiness, then you will have these glimpses of your mind's nature, the ground of all, which is empty, luminous clarity. You know, if you can release the struggle, um, allow your heart to open and respond with compassion and love, maybe in action. You know, this is all very liberating. It's loosening the grip of grasping and controlling and it's taking a layer off every time you practice. Your coarse mind, your subtle mind, your alaya vision on everything gets a little thinner and glimpses of ultimate um, Buddha nature come through. And um, I'll just read a quote from Treasury of Precious Qualities. It says, on this path, 
positive action transmutes ignorance into the ultimate Buddha nature, which is the wisdom that abides in either extreme of samsara or nirvana. And Zongzar Kensei Rinpoche kind of warns, he says that, you know, you have to put um, wisdom and compassion together. You can't just go into the emptiness of it. Like, oh, well, you know, it's all empty. Samsara as usual. Why do anything? I'll just, you know, sit, sit and space out. Meanwhile, you can't go to the other extreme and practice so much compassionate action that your um your it just works works righteousness you know working for your right you know for your for your um own advancement so zongzar kensi says understanding emptiness is is the real bodhicitta however bodhicitta should always have the wisdom of emptiness and the method of compassion together if the wisdom of emptiness is missing then bodhicitta is a good wish and has compassionate action, but is still dualistic. And this will not uproot samsara. However, if, if the method of compassion is missing, then it won't help oneself or others. So you have to have both. So without the wisdom of emptiness, the practice of compassion can just degenerate into like pity or sentimentality but without compassion, our practice can lead to kind of nihilism, you know, the lack of desire to engage and help other beings at all. So you have to have the two together. Um, so let's 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 uh, wander into this meditation that I I'm happy to lead you through tonight. It's um, been developed and practiced over 40 years by Dr. and Lama Alan Wallace. Um, and it's based on loving kindness. And um, let's see. It's, it's a really good one to do when you do feel a little worn out by samsara. Because, you know, even if your life is fairly, you know, going pretty well and your practice is going well and your attainment is fairly advanced, still individual karma and group karma arises out of nowhere. So it arises in forms like long-term pandemics that wear down our patients, you know, war crimes, so traumatic it breaks our heart, personal traumas that break our spirit, and then here's my favorite. I always put this in simple, unending interactions with bad actors, <laughs> like you're in your workplace. <laughs> and um, and and so then I, and it's in times like those. That's when our bodhicitta. We may know all the techniques, but it, it feels really difficult to access with any strength. It's kind of more of a oh, I have to than I than want than you want than a want to. You know, in other times we've just had like a you know and. Um, a day of eruptions and we get so locked up internally in our own uh, emotional reactivity of, of anger or pride or jealousy or craving or dullness um, that we can't see things clearly and and we're just completely unable to offer any kind of meaningful help to others um, and when that happens then it's super easy just to reify oneself and then others into these static concepts with no transcendence there's no freshness we don't we don't engage others with a fresh kindness <laughs> instead it, we, you know everything kind of devolves into sort of you know humdrum hopelessness and uh you know there's a real you over here and a real them over there and they better you know they better meet your needs <laughs> And the world better meet your needs. You know, it all gets very subject object and starts going in the wrong direction really fast. And, and of course, the point of bodhicitta isn't to get something for oneself, like for your own gain, but to be, you know, you're supposed to be effective in the world. But, you know, like I said, there's no boundary or line between the people we attend to and our own capacities. So we have to attend to both in order to cultivate bodhicitta. 
And the point is to attend to both <laughs> and figure out which one needs att attending to first. And sometimes that's you. <laughs> And then you can help the others, you know, put your mask on in the, out, in the airplane first, you know, put the oxygen mask on you, then put it on your, your partner. That's what they recommend. <laughs> um, and so, um, and so we want to, to, to um, learn to refresh and refurbish our, our, our own bodhicitta so that it, you know, can have a chance of arising spontaneously and without any effort. That's the, that's the goal. Um, and so we have to refurbish it because it's just, it's not a static thing, you know, oh, I got my bodhicitta on today. It's not that it's a dynamic. And so you have to feel it first. Um, so, um, so this guided meditation is very, very good, um, for this kind of thing you know, this bodhicitta burnout. <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and in the way we're doing it, it we're going to follow the instructions of the teachers, which believe that it's best to, to begin, first of all, begin with loving kindness, not, not one of the other ones, not equanimity, not sympathetic joy, not compassion. Start with loving kindness when you're really kind of low energy. And, um, and then also start with yourself. Don't start with the difficult person or the neutral person, or I mean, you, you know, or even the loving per, you know, the person that you love. Although there's nothing wrong with that because it gives you the the feeling, you know. But start with loving kindness for yourself, and establish and enhance internal flourishing for yourself, kind of refilling your coifers, and then extend it out to others in the world. Um, Tuka also, who I just led a, I co-led co a for immeasurables retreat with a few weeks ago, he said, nourishing compassionate essence at our heart can go beyond the personal self and courageously bring immeasurable compassion out to others. So I've heard this again and again. I feel like I'm on solid footing here. I'm not just being a psychotherapist saying, oh, self-compassion, you know, nurture yourself. This is a real thing in Buddhism as well. And this meditation is actually being researched right now at the Center for Contemplative Research, where I, I, I work as a, a researcher half the time um, and teach university master's level courses for psychotherapists the other half of the year. Um, and it's an antidote to mental imbalance. It's being researched at the moment. It'll soon be evidence-based, which will please the scientists. And it's, as I said, um, it's been developed over 40 years. I can say for a fact, by my longtime friend, I have known him for 40 years, Dr. Alan Wallace, Lama, Lama Allen, we call him. And it's called the Fourfold Vision Quest of Loving Kindness. So I'm um, just going to spend the last several minutes here guiding you through it. It's based out, it's based on four questions. So are you ready to reflect? Don't fall asleep. <laughs> okay. So the first question or quest is, what is your vision of your own flourishing? What will truly make you happy with fulfillment? meaning, and genuine happiness. Bring to mind your own realization of your heart's desire. And as you breathe out, arouse this aspiration of loving kindness. May I be truly well and happy. May I realize this vision of truly flourishing. And with each outbreath, letting your imagination play. Imagine experiencing such well-being breath by breath here and now. So let's just take a few moments and really visualize that. Your vision of your own flourishing, what would truly make you happy, fulfilled, 
with meaning and genuine happiness, your own realization of your heart's desire. Just bring that to mind and really let your imagination play. Bring it to mind with as much clarity and detail as you possibly can. And then the next, <clears throat> the next part of the quest is with, with the recognition that there is no possible way that any of us here can realize such well-being entirely on our own without any help from the environment, other people, other sentient beings, we raise the second question, which is, what would you love to receive from the world around you, from other people, teachers, and friends, to enable you to reach your own heart's desire, your own genuine happiness? Bring richly to mind your entanglement with all those around you, all arising in interdependence with each other. And then with each in-breath, arise loving kindness for yourself with the wish, may I receive all that I truly need from the world around me to facilitate and enable me to reach my heart's desire. Then breath by breath, letting your imagination play in terms of receiving all that you need, your mundane needs, your spiritual needs, from moment to moment, day to day, all that you truly need rises up to meet you. Imagine this to be true here and now. And we'll just take a few minutes to feel that. And now a third recognition, which is that there is no way that we will find the fulfillment that we seek without an inner transformation. It can't happen just from the outside. So now in the same spirit of loving kindness, raise the question, how would you love to transform and evolve as a human being? From what qualities would you love to be free? And with what qualities would you love to be imbued? How would you love to transform into the person you would like to become? Imagine. Then breath by breath, imagine as you breathe out, as if you were breathing life into this imagined transformation. Imagine here and now, evolving into the person you would love to become. Imagine this taking place very rapidly right now. 
And we'll take a couple of minutes to feel that. And now the recognition that none of us exist in isolation, autonomously independent of our environment with other sentient beings. Our very existence is one of interdependence, which means our sense of well being and our flourishing, our joys and our sorrows, are also arising within the fabric and the net of our interrelationships with those around us. So now, once again, in the spirit of loving kindness for yourself, envision, in order to imbue your own life with the greatest possible sense of meaning, of satisfaction and fulfillment, and with the awareness of your interdependence with all those around you, Imagine now, what would you love to offer to the world around you, drawing on your unique background, your skills, your gifts, your vision? What would you love to offer to those who are near and far, over the short term and over the long term? And with each out breath, let your imagination play and here and now, breathing out the good, breathing out the blessings, breathing out your very best, what you would like to offer to the world, offering here and now your very best. And let's take a moment and imagine that. And now just release all aspirations and all appearances and let your awareness rest in its own nature, illuminating all appearances, but grasping onto none. And let's just dedicate the merit of this meditation and time together towards this vision of flourishing for oneself and for all beings. And if you wish to check in with your bodhicitta rating, <laughs> your scale of one to 10, and just see uh, if your rating has changed up, down, or sideways, please do. <laughs> And um, yeah, thank you. It's been, oh, good. Good, Jason, thank you, I'm glad, yeah. Good. So we have a few minutes if anybody has any questions, um, you can unmute yourself and just ask a question or make a comment or, you know, get out of the box in whatever way you feel like it. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm going to jump in um, to ask you um, a very specific question, actually. Thank you for your wealth of information. Uh, and it, it's really quite a wonderful cycle. But the, this question I had had to do with something you said early on, which had to do with how you manage the the starting of this cultivation. Um, and when you're tired, there's a kind of a sense of like, I don't want to say it, this is just a very frivolous way to say it, fake it till you make it. But, you know, there's a, there's a, you mentioned that, that you, sometimes you, I feel I get caught in my pattern of just kind of tired dullness and, and fatigue and kind of, I get really tweaked and kind of uncovering that enlightenment seems far away and I'm really stuck in this samsara. How do you, how do you cultivate that so that it's a, you know, I, I think you've talked about all these very effective ways to do it, but I'm wondering if you could just address that sort of like, okay, I'm stuck. I need to do something to, to pretend you know, like some, you know, even Chandra say, just smile because the energy of smiling yeah. cultivates happiness. So I just wondered if you could kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, fortunately, you know, psychotherapy also has a lot of great methods these days because there is this idea of compassion fatigue. And so Kristen Neff has all the, you know, uh, self-compassion exercises. There's a lot of somatic exercises. And um, so, so there are a few things that can just kind of get us going, you know, to really stimulate some well-being, I like that Chandra uh, Chandra mentioned just turning up the sides of your mouth. Believe it or not, that's been proven to bring a, a feeling of peace and happiness and fulfillment. Just turning up the corners of your mouth. Kristen Neff um, says that when you're in a state of real, you know, bodhicitta, uh, bodhicitta burnout, <laughs> she says you have to have self-compassion first. And she's, she likes, again, back to somatic techniques, she's really in favor of just taking a moment wherever you are and doing, um, doing one of these sort of three different self-compassionate gestures. One is just to put your hand on the side of your face, you know, like your mother might have stroked you when you were young and just, just, just like, oh, you know, poor thing, poor thing, you're tired. You know, it's been a long day. You know, I, I care for you. I care for you. Um, another is just to hold, give yourself a, you know, a hold, a, a hug, <laughs> hold your, you know, like I'm here for you. I'm here, you know, some self-compassion, you know, and, or just put your hands over your heart. If you can lay down, you know, which isn't always possible in the grocery store, but, you know, if you're at home, you can lay down and just put your hands over your heart and try to access that portal of white light. That is your Buddha nature. Um, Every once in a while, I'll find a Mahayana reading that actually says that this Buddha nature in your heart is like a, a brightly shining um, white light. Uh, they don't like to be that concrete about it in general. You know, it's more like an energy or a feeling. But almost every tradition I've studied has some version of white light that comes through your heart not just Buddhism. And I've studied all kinds of religions. I have a master's of divinity and, and a lot of traditions have some version of the white light that comes through your heart. So I think you're safe putting your hands on your heart and just breathing and trying to get a felt sense of that white light coming through, you know, and first, first and foremost, just for yourself to re reduce your fatigue. You know, and then, you know, and maybe you just stay right there with self-compassion and don't move out to the world. Certainly if it's, you know, after a long day of work and you have some alone time in your own home, which sometimes we do, sometimes we don't if we have a family, but, you know, just laying down and taking a moment to, to, uh, to, to, to put, to um, give some kindness and compassion to yourself is, really, really important. You can do the deep breathing or just normal breathing that I was talking about that gives you that internal massage of, you know, your clothes moving against your skin, your skin against your muscles, you know, that can be really, really replenishing. And then if you want to start moving out or 
you want to you know really refill your heart i would i would do what we did early on tonight which is to take you know pick one person that you just love unconditionally you know if it's a child or a spouse or it could be your dog you know i mean i love my dog <laughs> and i that you know i don't want any harm done to my dog he's right there you can see him do you see my dog everybody you can look at my dog isn't he cute <laughs> and I, I i'm all about my you know if i think of my dog i'm automatically happy and i just don't want any harm to come to him and so that's an easy way to just remember oh yeah you know i'm alive in there <laughs> I'm, my heart's alive. There's something in there that feels something that's, you know, um, you know, and then from there, take it out to yourself, take it out to the situation that depleted you, you know, maybe if you can without perseverating on it, you know, or maybe not, maybe you cocoon and you don't think about the things that drained you and, and wore you out for the day. You know, it's just really important. I mean, there are, there are a few um, contemplative suggestions to contemplative methods from Buddhism. One is um, think about one of your, your spiritual teachers who you may have seen in action with a lot of bodhicitta and bring them to mind. Because if we don't know of anybody who has great bodhicitta and has shown us that, how, how can we ever think we can do it? <laughs> So you can think of, I have several Buddhist teachers, I just bring them to mind and I can see these particular images of them being so generous with other people. And I think, okay, all right, if they can do it, you know, it can be done. You know, at least it can be done. I don't know that I can do it, but at least can, it can be done. And so it's inspiring. Um, they also recommend solitude, solo retreats to get replenished. Um, yeah, we shouldn't run on empty and we shouldn't do this just out of a, you know, we have to, or it's part of a nundro or, you know, we're going to run dry that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> well, I think we're out of time, but it was nice to be with you. You guys are a great group and um, yeah, I'm happy to come back. Let me know when you want to feed some more demons. I always love doing that. 